So good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Staley. I am the Executive Director of Dyslexia Canada, and I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar today. We have attendees from right across Canada, so it's quite exciting to be able to offer programs and resources um, right across the country. So welcome to our webinar, Getting Ready to Read, Preparing Your Preschooler for Reading and Writing. So Dyslexia Canada is a national charity which is dedicated to ensuring that every child in Canada with dyslexia has access to fair and equitable education. We are proud to work with some amazing organizations and volunteers right across Canada who are passionate about making sure that all children learn how to read and write. And our speaker tonight is just one of those people. Before we jump in, a couple of announcements of some upcoming events that Dyslexia Canada is hosting. So on May 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we are hosting another webinar that's focused on assistive technology and tools for students and adults with dyslexia. And then on June 12th, we're quite excited to be hosting our first event. It's free for kids and families. So you can come and join our guest artist and illustrator, Sarah Jane Vickery, as she leads a fun cartooning workshop. And she'll pro also provide her experience with dyslexia and how it shaped where she is today. So with that, I would love to introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Sandra Jack Mallet it holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Curriculum Studies Elementary Education from the University of Alberta. Prior to commencing her doctoral work, she owned and operated the Wingate Literacy Clinic where she worked with students struggling to learn to read and write. Currently, Dr. Jack Malik is an assistant professor in the Department of Education at Cape Breton University, where she teaches English language arts and curriculum studies courses. Sandra is a member of the Board of Directors for the Society for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Nova Scotians, Cape Breton Branch, and she is also a member of the Board of Director of Dyslexia Canada. And last but not least, Sandra is the proud mother of two adult daughters. So Sandra has promised to get to as many questions um, as time allows, so please feel free to ask your questions along the way. Um, they'll take the questions as they come in. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Click on that. You can type in your question and we'll, we'll ask that of Sandra as we go. Also, we are recording this session. So the recording and the PowerPoint slide will be provided on our website after the program. So if you wanted to go back to watch it again or share it with friends and family, you are more than welcome to do that. So with that, I will hand it over to Sandra. Thank you, Christine. A warm welcome and greeting uh, coming to you from uh, Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. And I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and I'm a visitor, so I wanted to share that. Um, Christine is, uh, gave a little bit of my background, but mostly what I wanted to say is that um, I come out of um, elementary school teaching. I taught kindergarten in the early grades for most of my career. And I've only been a university professor for the past five years. Prior to coming to Cape Breton University, I was a um, school administrator in Gila, Manitoba and Churchill in Manitoba. Um, so today I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, building that foundation with our preschool children so when they come to school, uh, they're ready to go or as ready as, as we can support them to be. Um, I also wanted to just give a little um, shout out uh, to uh, friends in Foxborough, Ontario, who are joining us tonight and thank them for that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say before we get going, uh, there's a kind of a tension that I always experience when talking to parents and guardians um, because each child, develops at his or her own pace. Uh, however, having said that, there are certain benchmarks that we hope that children are going to meet um, as they continue on on their journey of learning to speak and then learning uh, to read and write. So, so I know it's difficult not to compare your preschooler with another preschooler, one who might be a little more precocious or less precocious, um, but the general rule of thumb that I like 
um, is, you know, by the time the child is three, um, if the child can make him or her or their self understood to someone who they're not in regular contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, then you're on pretty solid ground there. And if they can um, express a range of emotions and feelings and desires and wants uh, to someone who doesn't hear them speak every day, uh, then you're on pretty good standing. If, however, your child gets to that three mark and can't make him or her or they self understood, um, it's really a good idea um, to think about um, reaching out to your family doc, to a speech pathologist, um, to get some early intervention. Uh, the earlier that we intervene um, with our youngsters, uh, the better the better the turnaround time is, the better it is for the child in the short run and in the long run. Uh, most particularly if, if a child is unable to make him or her, they self understood, then they must be frustrated. And so we wanted to attend to that right away. Um, so I wanted to also mention that I'm happy to take questions. Uh, uh, Christine's gonna manage the questions. So uh, I, I really prefer this to be a conversation and um, for me, not just to look at a screen for the next uh, 45 minutes. So anything at all, um, I'll endeavor to answer it. Um, so Christine, um, would you change to the next slide, please? I think there's a question there, Christine, but I'll, I'll let you, uh, should we answer that one, Christine, before we go ahead with this? Well, let's keep going because you might actually answer this. Okay. So there's three areas that I would like to, I'm just gonna see if I can move this over here. Oh, that's better. There are three areas that I'd like to talk to you about and the research on, uh, by the way, <clears throat> Reading is one of the most researched areas on the face of the earth. Um, there's tons and tons and of work done in, in learning how to read and write. Um, so these are three areas that um, we can look at a youngster and we can say these are predictors. These, these are predictors um, in the moment. These <clears throat> what the child's doing in these three areas can predict how the child's going to do uh, when they come to learn uh, to, to read and write. So there's oral language, and that's not, that's um, production, the child speaking, and also uh, listening. And the oral language, the big focus that I'm, you're gonna hear me say over and over again is this idea about pushing vocabulary. And when I say pushing vocabulary, that means if the child wants to read good night moon and you're ready to for the day to be over, but the child will take it one more time as much as you can. If you're <clears throat> at the dining room table and you're talking, you're uh, laying the table, say, you can just say it. This is the knife. This is the fork. This is the place, however you lay your table, but get, every opportunity that you have, give your child language, um, ask your child questions. Ask your child to repeat back. What color are your shoes? My shoes are blue. Any chance that you can get to enrich it. It's kind of like the, the moment the child wakes up, we want to bathe the child in vocabulary. Um, not that it's not important to have quiet time, not suggesting that for a moment. What I am suggesting, bathing your child in vocabulary um, and, and um, response vocabulary, not plunked in front of a TV. I, I'm not opposed to TV. I'm a, just, you know, little bits here and there are good, but it's that interaction back and forth, that bathing of language into the child over and over and over again, as many chances as you can, um, as many different people, caregivers as possible with your child, let them engage with your child, speak to your child. There's no, no need at all. There's no research to support changing your vocabulary for the child. If you are, um, you know, a PhD in something, speak to your child at that level, that language, and the child will come up to it. Um, so there's no need to, to, if you will, baby talk or, or talk down. Um, give your child words, let them play with those words. And you know, in that moment, they might not get it, but you know, two or three weeks, that three weeks down the road, you might hear your child say, say a word and you might be quite surprised. So oral language and listening comprehension, I'm going to give some suggestions for some activities in those two areas. The second one 
which you probably hear a lot, a lot about is this idea of phonological awareness and alphabet awareness. Um, we're going to talk about that and we're going to, I'm going to try to explain what is meant by phonological awareness. Um, basically, what we're saying with phonological awareness, phono, like think of phone, um, and that's sounds. And that's the sounds of the English language. And at the preschool level, we just want children to play with sounds. Uh, it's not about at, at, the, at this young age, two, three, and four, it's not about the child sitting down and reading print. It's really about, again, bathing the child in sound, playing with the sound, having fun with it, um, and taking the sounds apart, putting the sounds back together. And all this can be done before a child even is ever sets his or her or they eyes on, on the letter E or B or whatever. It's just that playing with it, immersion and playing. And then because the point of all of this is moving the child to reading, then the other thing we're gonna talk about um, building on, build, you're trying to build this very strong foundation so that the ground the children are standing on is firm and solid. The, the language acquisition ground, the firmer, the more solid it is, the better chance your child's going to have um, as they move into learning to read, and that's print knowledge. Um, are there any questions so far before we move to the next slide, Christine? The, the one question is about benchmarking, but I think we'll probably get there um, as you go along. Sorry, what can you tell me exactly the question? Um, what is the benchmark for Saskatchewan? And I'm assuming sort of what level or what, what are the expectations for a child at certain ages? Right, right. So, so just briefly on that, uh, each province and territory has their own set of outcomes and they break it down by grade level starting uh, Ontario, it's junior kindergarten, senior kindergarten here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, they call it, um, pre-primary, primary, and then grade one. And at each level, there's a series of benchmarks um, um, that relate to English language arts and, and the outcomes that they hope that the child's going to have um, um, at each of those grade levels. Um, and in Saskatchewan then, yeah, you, those are publicly available documents and they, they're online and you can go in and look and it'll say, you know, by June, the, the child is able to, and it'll list a series of things that, that in English language arts under six, in six areas, um, reading, writing, speaking, listening, um, viewing, and representing. Um, so that's, that's how they break up this six English language arts, and then there are outcomes in each of those six areas. They are subsequently then broken down by grade, starting in junior kindergarten or however, Junior kindergarten is referred to in your province or territory. Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide there? Please. Okay, so we have this idea that we just, children just learn to listen. Um, but what, what we want to do in our efforts to build that very strong foundation is to uh, do it purposefully, teach children to listen. So they're listening actively, attentively. And the, la the third one is super important for, re uh, for learning to read analytically. Um, and I'm gonna give a couple of examples of games that you can play with your preschool children, um, if you're parent, guardian, grandparents, that help to develop these critical skills. And all the while, as I'm describing these activities, um, think about that idea of bathing your child in, in, in vocabulary, pushing the vocabulary, not to the point like being pushy, but maybe I should put bathing, bathing, because I, I, I love to bathe. So like sitting in a tub of vocabulary every day. And the most important thing of all of this too is just, reading to your children, reading to your children, how many times they want to hear the same story, it's okay. And I'm going to give you a couple of activities so that maybe when it is the 39th time they want to hear Goodnight Moon, you could do a couple of activities and it, it changes the experience for kids. 
Um, so one thing that we like to do with preschool children um, is to listen for everyday sounds. So you can have your children, your child or children sitting and they could be listening for, uh, for example, scissors snipping, water running, uh, birds chirping. And what I like to do with preschool children is to get them to do it eyes open and eyes closed and try to get them to identify the sounds. Let's, you could just do it um, with one or two sounds, identify the sounds and remember the order and sometimes attempt to locate the source. Oh, you hear birds chirping? Where's that coming from? Um, and maybe the child will turn and face the window, an open window and point outside. Um, a similar activity, for example, with Goodnight Moon or any book that your child likes to hear over and over and over again, it's this analytical listening. So read the book to the child in your regular cadence, your regular pace, and come to a word and replace a real word with a nonsense word. So um, alligator pie, alligator pie, if I don't follow, uh, if I don't school bus, I think I'm going to die. So the child has to, lit the school, school bus is the wrong word, right? Um, so the child has to listen very attentively to pick up that word that doesn't belong. Or you can start with a nonsense word, alligator pie, alligator pie. If I don't, I think I'm gonna die. Start off with something nonsense. That's a bit easier for the child to pick up a word that's completely nonsensical and then go in uh, and replace it with a word, just not the right word. That activity is, is very powerful in, in terms of getting the child to listen analytically. Um, uh, so what we're trying to do is get the kids to listen, not for what they expect, particularly because we're reading so much of that rhyming stuff in that early going, like all the Dr. Seuss. Um, so they, they, when you read Dr. Seuss over and over again, children come to expect. But when you now substitute in the nonsense or of the wrong word, um, they now have to actually um, hear, they have to listen actively and attentively and analytically, those three words that we saw, um, to try to find that, that word that doesn't, doesn't belong. Um, we want to talk to children about listening with eyes open and eyes closed. And how does that feel? Um, can they hear noises from within their body? And, and what do they hear? And, and a thing that's a really great activity with kids um, with noises that their body makes, first of all, to get them to name it, name the sounds they hear, and then try to get them um, to make um, uh, a comparison. So these are actually examples that I've had from kids, um, preschoolers, when a child um, stomach grumbles, the child says, it sounds like quiet thunder. That's very astute. It's also a simile, which we don't teach until grade nine in regular old English language arts, I think. Um, or when a child, a child once exhaled in a kindergarten class and it says, he, and the kid said to me, it sounds like the air coming out of a balloon. And once, this is when I was in the North, uh, a child farted and the child said, oh, it sounds like Dada's old lawnmower. That's very astute listening that our youngsters are doing. And it's very rich vocabulary. You're making this remarkable simile. That's very, that's exactly what we want. That richness, that attentiveness, uh, that's exactly what we want. Um, another thing that you can do is get it, once the child's good with one or two sounds, you can add three sounds to it and then get the child to name them in sequence. And this is so cool because then you get first, next, finally, or you can go nominal, first, second, third. And that's probably more for a four-year-old, but that, that's pushing vocabulary. First, I heard this, then I heard that. After that, I heard that. And finally, we heard that. That's very rich for a, a preschooler to be able to do, but totally doable. If you start saying, first, we're going to put your coat on, then we're going to put your sneakers on, then we'll put your sunscreen on, then we're going outside. That kind of bathing in that language again. First, we heard the, whatever your sounds are. Um, that's another opportunity. 
Um, another one around this listening analytically. Um, once a child gets proficient in naming the sounds, you can do the same activity and omit the sound and ask the child to, um, to identify the omitted sound. Or you can have the child lay down on the floor without, if they will, without peeking, but it's a game, so a little peeking is okay. And you yourself go to an area in the room and make an animal sound. And the child must point to the area, to the direction of the sound and um, name the part of the room. Again, pushing that vocabulary. Oh, mommy, you're standing next to the window. Oh, dada, you're standing behind the chair. Um, oh, daddy, you're standing down the hallway. All this beautiful prepositional usage that our children can do at, as preschoolers. Um, <clears throat> down the hall, under the table, all those kinds of prepositions that are really important. Think about when a kid's in kindergarten and the, and the kindergarten teacher will say, okay, everyone stand in line. We're gonna go down the hall. All that prepositional use, which we want uh, kids to be able uh, to have access to. Um, Christine, how are we doing? I see some pops in the chat there. Um, uh, any other questions before we go on to the next slide? Yes, I have a question here. It says, my son can't pay attention for very long. How much time should I be trying to do this with him every day? So that's a very good question. And what we're trying to do with our youngsters is just push it. So if your son's able to attend for 15 seconds on Monday, and then on, on Wednesday, it's up to 20 seconds, and you can actually chart that for your child. Um, if they can sit through a story, you know, for one minute they can sit, that's great. And then at the end of the month, you can say, look, we, when we started here, we could only sit for one page. A page might be more meaningful for a child, but it's something that we want to show progress over time. And it needs to be fun. The minute these things are perceived by your child as a, as a job that they have to do, then, then we're, we've got our feet in the wrong room. We want to always keep our feet firmly planted in the fun room. The, the child shouldn't know at this point that what we're doing. Not that we want to be clandestine, but it really, it, they shouldn't, they, what they should know is this is so fun to lie down on the floor with mommy and and point and mommy's making animal noises and then I get to tell her where she, I mean, that's just great fun. Um, but if it's perceived as work, they're gonna be in school with work uh, for many years. We don't need to, we really don't need to start that early. Um, and if you find that your child's getting frustrated with any of this, just stop and pull out those favorite picture books and, and just have a read of the picture books. Was there something else, Christine, or shall we go to the next slide? We can go to the next slide. Okay, how are we doing for time? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is the, this is the, um, the million dollar word. So phonological awareness is, the, think of it as an umbrella. Think, really think about all those letters running outside the edge of the umbrella, phonological awareness. And again, Phono is sound um, and awareness of those sounds and the logic that goes with them. So it's this big term and it really encompasses many ideas. And what we're trying to do as parents of preschoolers is start to develop some of those skills. They're gonna continue developing them when we're, when, once they're at school, but we wanna start developing them at home. So some of the skills that are included under that big umbrella, now think of the spines of the umbrella, these are each of the individual skills. So a grapheme, a graph is a picture, right? A picture of something. A grapheme uh, is just the letter, like a letter A, that's a grapheme, and it, it represents a sound, um, A or A uh, or long A. It's just a picture. So that's part of final, your child's gonna have to learn that this is a B, this is a picture of B. They're gonna to have to learn that too. Syllables, they're gonna to have to learn about syllables um, and they're gonna learn about rhyming um, and phonemic awareness. This is another one that get mixed up and parents get nervous about this and guardians. So phonemic awareness is part of the big umbrella of phonological awareness. 
and a phoneme. What's a phoneme? So if we go down onto the slide there, so what is a phoneme? It's the smallest, smallest, smallest unit of meaningful sound in a language. So if you look at the word bit and bot, so bit has b, i, t. So we would say that word has three phonemes. And if you look at bot, it has b, a, t, also has three phonemes. Completely different words, right? Um, represented with the, the, the short I and the O-U-G-H, completely different representation, different graphemes uh, to, to represent it. The same as bet and boat. So we still have the, the same B for bet, the same B for boat, and then the T's on the end, but in the middle, we have short E and vowel team OA. So that's the a phoneme. Your child has to know the phonemes, not now, not when they're two or three or four. They're going to be um, learning those as they learn to read at school, uh, learn to read at school. Um, but that's what a phoneme is, the smallest unit of meaningful sound uh, in a language. Um, uh, so other things they're going to learn about blending. So they're going to take two um, phonemes like F and L f and all, and they're going to learn to blend that full, flap my wings. Um, they're going to learn to um, delete things. So in the word cats, if I have cat, what happens when we take away the s? And hopefully the child, once they get into grade one, will be able to say it goes from cats plural to cats singular. They're going to have to discriminate sounds, p's and b's and b's and d's. They're going to have to identify sounds and letters. They're going to have to segment, and they're going to have to know phonetics. Um, and so this phonetics applies to what I mentioned earlier, where if you get a child who's three, three and a bit, three and a couple months, and the only one that can understand the child is the primary caregiver, um, that's really a good time to get to, to think about um, getting a speech path in there. Uh, there might be a need uh, to take them to the family doctor. There might be some issues um, with uh, the, maybe the child's had four or five ear infections. And every time a child has ear infections, um, there's like two or three weeks where the, the proper hearing has been interrupted. Uh, they might need tubes. There might be different issues. A family doctor can refer on to a speech path. Um, the earlier we do that, the better, because there's often a wait list for speech paths. You certainly don't want to wait until the child goes to school. You want to get on that as soon as you can. Um, if you happen to have a good health care uh, plan, uh, they will cover it. Um, uh, so many sessions per year. But they uh, speech paths do incredibly good work uh, to support kids. I often will hear parents say, well, I just thought it was cute. Um, but really the test is, can someone else understand um, um, uh, what your child is saying? Um, so that's, that's really what we wanna try to discern at that point. Um, another yeah. activity, oh, sorry. sorry I, I have a, a question here, kind of following up on that. So I have um, one person here who has said, um, they, I believe they have a child who is, I think about senior kindergarten, the older brother is in grade three and has dyslexia. So with the younger child, there may be issues with um, phonemic awareness as well as perhaps some motor speech difficulties, but hearing and vision is okay. What, what would you suggest they do? What sort of support can you get for a senior kindergarten child? So if the older sibling's been identified, we know that there's um, a genetic predisposition. So that's a red flag. Um, if the child's having other issues that you described, there were two other ones, those are additional red flags. So um, unfortunately, um, there's still this, and we're working hard to get rid of it. There's still this idea um, that oh, he's only, or she's only in, they're, they're only in senior kindergarten, give them more time. Um, and, you know, if the child didn't have a dyslexic sibling, if they didn't have the other two issues that you mentioned, you know, I might, I might think about that, but every, every minute that passes, 
um, is a minute that your kid's not getting the support that they need. Um, so you have to, even in that early going, advocate, 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 um, get the child on, on lists for testing, um, school-based testing, they can do some stuff, see if there are other red flags. Um, if you can find a, an external tutor, um, that would be good. Um, get a speech path if, if that's, their speech paths are really good to try to correct the phonetics, the production of sound within the child's mouth. Um, they can be very helpful. And then the speech path though, I want us to just say that speech paths, I, I'm singing their praises. I, I you know, they, they, I, they're amazing. However, they're only as good as the work that you do at home. The speech path is with your, if it's a four or five year old, maybe 30 minutes or 45 minutes once a week. What's really important there is all the activities that the speech path gives to the family to work on when in between visits. That's when, that's when the work gets done is in between visits, um, following up. Because what we're trying to do, that again, think about that strong, strong foundation. What we're trying to do is build a foundation, a strong foundation for the child to stand. And whatever, whatever's being done incorrectly in their mouth, in the production area, well, we need to correct that. And that's that, that the correction work doesn't happen in those 45 minutes. It happens at home with whomever the child lives with, the, the guardians, whomever it is, uh, the family members, everybody's singing the same song to the child. Whenever the error is made, then the, just very quietly, um, the, the child, most often we just say it back to the child incorrectly, uh, correctly, sorry. If they say incorrectly, we just say it back to them correctly or whatever the activities that the speech path has provided, just. It's, it's not, a, it, not to make the child wrong, just to very naturally embed that in your bathing of the child in the language. Um, yes, so I'm seeing uh, tonsils, adenoids, yeah. It, every, all of this stuff makes it more complicated and um, it's a process. So we have to think about it. We have to feel the, the need to intervene early and we have to think about, we don't have to do everything. We're not gonna fix this all on Monday. This is a process and it's gonna take time and it's gonna take consistency. And that's where the, and it's gonna take experts to help. Um, and that's where the that's where the day-to-day -day work of, of, the, of the parents and guardians who are in the trenches with these youngsters or the daycare workers who are in the trenches with these worker, with these children have to be on the same page and all have the child, the child needs to hear the same corrected message um, uh, wherever they go. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, a couple of other things that we can do uh, with children, a couple of games, uh, rhyming, for example, rhyming robots, favorite word is shake. Which one of these words can he have? And we're looking for another rhyming word. And so can the child hear meat, steak, or corn, and of course, it's uh, shake and steak. All those um, uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, those are perfect um, to, to read with children over and over and over again. Um, and, then, and then what you wanna do is um, when you get to the end of it, where the second rhyme comes in, one fish, two fish, red fish, don't say it, let the child say it. Um, and so then let them put the word in. That tells you that they're hearing, that tells you that they're memorizing, tells you a lot. It tells you that they can hold that information in their little minds and they can manipulate it and they can produce it at the good minute, at the right spot. So that the, when the child's able to do that, that's, that's a very exciting time when I see a youngster starting to be able to do that because they're demonstrating so much in that moment. Um, alliteration, very important for children. So Peter Piper picked, and then go ahead with your youngster and make up, uh, make up their own. Uh, neat, Nancy, never, and then as many words as this, and as silly, silly, silly as, as it can possibly get. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to say uh, around this syllable deletion, and mostly starting off with syllable counting, we have lots of youngsters who speak quickly. Um, and so I get children to, let's put their, let's say tomorrow. Tomorrow sometimes is a word that tricks our, our preschool children to put their hand up like a fist. Tomorrow. 
and just put one finger up on Tom, second finger up more row. How many pieces in that word? Look at your finger, one, two, three pieces, three pieces in that word. Or to get them to put their hand, uh, open their hand up and put it underneath their chin, Tom Moro. How many times does your chin drop down? That's how many syllables there are. Um, syllable deletion with preschool children, we can start that off with um, compound words like baseball. If I, I say to a four-year-old, um, if I took off ball, if I, we started off with baseball and I took off ball, what would be left? So that's a, another chance where a child can manipulate, do something in your brain that you can't see. And then if, if what do we take off ball? If the child says base, you know you're in good shape. So they're demonstrating their intelligence to us when we're asking them to do these little jobs. But again, it's all, it, this can be done, um, you know, it's that when they're captive audiences in their car seats. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be 60 minutes of it. It can just be two or three minutes of it. Um, it, it can just be, a minute of it, whatever your child can tolerate. Okay, could we go, may we please go to the next one? Or if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take the question. Okay, so this strong foundation that we're building, it is purposeful because we know that our youngsters at some point are gonna start reading. And it's not that they just start one day and it's not just that they wake up and they know all their letters. And I, you know, most homes that I've been in, uh, I'll see um, magnetic letters on the fridge, um, on a whiteboard, something like that. And, and oftentimes children will um, learn the letters of their name and be able to write their names. Um, what we're trying to get children to understand um, is that reading is a code. It's this kind of secret code and they have to learn to decode it. They have to figure out the code. And in early going, I like to set it up like that, you know, like this secret code. Um, and what they need to understand is that the letters, the graphemes are used to represent the sounds of our speech because this is the most important thing, words, are sounds pushed together. And we speak quickly. We don't speak the, uh, k, at, s, at, uh, mm. We don't speak like that. We take the sounds and we push them together so that we can speak more fluently and more quickly. That's a pretty sophisticated notion for children to understand that words are sounds pushed together and they can be pushed together. You can push k, at, together and you can pull it apart. Um, and if you change k to b, then you get b at. All of this is playing with sounds again. It can be done with a child in a car seat without any pencil or paper. If you say to the child, I have the word cat and you say k at. What happens if I change k to s? Or, and, the, and then the child might be able to say sat and they say, oh, what happens if I change it to mmm, and the child says, oh, mommy, that's easy, mat. And then I say, well, what happens if I add S on the end? So you see, you're upping the cognitive load here. You're asking, you're demanding more of your child. And then you can delete and you can say, and remember the child hasn't written anything down yet. We're all just playing here. And then you say, well, what would happen if I took away M? So that's the deletion idea, right? And the child would say, at. Um, that's where we're going, playing, playing. But we do have to introduce the graphemes, the pictures. So um, a, 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 one thing I like to do, and kids seem to like to do this, and I love it because it's, um, it's a great vocabulary push. Um, uh, if you take a deck of cards and um, put pictures, right? And, you're, and you have a, a D pile and a B pile, and you ask the child to look at the picture to say the name. So the child picks up the first one and it's duck. And the child says duck. And then you, the child knows that D makes D and put it in the D pile. Um, and you can, you can just start off with D words. <coughs> Excuse me, just start off with one letter 
and matching words. Um, and then you can up this idea of continually upping the cognitive load, go through it. So the one, just put D words in there. So the child gets really good because you want the child to experience success and build on success. So the youngster is able to get five D words right and then slip in a non-D word. So maybe it's gonna be a B word, boat. And then you say, oh, that doesn't, mommy, that's a boat. It doesn't go, duh. Oh, then maybe we should make a new pile and we'll put the B at the top and then we'll get some B words going. And so that can be done um, you know, with five letters or six letters or however you wanna do it. Um, so that's, that's um, another way to start moving the child uh, toward knowledge about print. Um, and and um, you'll find that the child will start doing what they call environmental reading. So if you're out and about and, and the ch like McDonald's, children often will recognize uh, McDonald's um, and they'll, they'll see Amazon boxes. Children now seem to know what Amazon boxes are. Um, so that's environmental print. It's all part of this laying the strong foundation. And then we go from that big, broad environmental print, which is still meaning making, right? When that Amazon box shows up at your front door, the child, there's a lot of meaning there. But now we're trying to um, bring it from the broadness of the environmental meaning into the specific of the correspondence, knowing that the letter, the grapheme B, the picture of B is a symbol and I like to use that word symbol because youngsters um, in kindergarten, if you draw a heart and, and, and you ask them what it is, they'll say that's, that's the heart. They know what that is. So I like that. And you say, that's not really my heart. My heart's inside my chest. You can get them to listen for it. Boom, 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 boom. Um, so this is a symbol of and, and put that in there. Boom, 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 boom. And then the, the graphing, the picture of the bee. Um, so those are... Those are some ideas. Um, the most important thing that I want to say, remember that, that your feet are always firmly planted in funville, um, fun times. As soon as your child is not interested, stop and then try it again. Um, and that it's really about play, um, um, playing with language and building that strong foundation and bathing, bathing, bathing your child in as much language as you can. And if you know that you are a particularly quick speaker, I would invite you to think about that um, and slow it down. It, usually if your child hasn't had any ear infections or anything like that, <clears throat> if they're pronouncing words incorrectly, <coughs> oftentimes it's because that's what they're hearing. And usually you'll get a mis mispronunciation at the end of the word. Um, so if the child said morrow for tomorrow, just be really purposeful. Tomorrow we are going to the park and make sure you're hitting the, the first sound. The kids usually pick up the vowel sounds and make sure you hit the last sound. Tomorrow we're going to the park to slide on the slide. Um, and just slow it down. Um, and you might be surprised how many more words your child can pick up. And don't be afraid to, um, to use words that you have in your mind is beyond the child's capacity. Really not. And help the kid make those it's called scaffolding in my business. Scaffold from what the child knows to this idea or this word that you want the child to know. Remember when we went to auntie's house and we, and then whatever you did there, find a link to this new idea that you're trying to introduce your child to. Um, and as much patience as you have and as much energy as you have, talk to the little guys and gals, little youngsters, and, and do that bathing, bathing, bathing in vocabulary. Um, and I, I'm, that's all I had to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions, Christine. So we do have actually quite a few questions. I'm actually going to stop my, my screen share here. So I've got one here. Um, we get asked this question quite a bit, actually. So what is a reasonable age to expect the average child who has been um, uh, kind of cleared of any hearing issues or, or uh, language issues like that? What's, 
what is reasonable to expect the average child to learn how to read or to start reading? And when should a parent be worried? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, here's the thing. From junior kindergarten or however it's referred to in your province or territory to the end of grade three, we are teaching children to read. That's what we do as early elementary teachers. We teach children to read. And in grade four, there's this tacit idea that children now are reading to learn more independently. Um, if I myself had a youngster, one of my two who wasn't reading in the middle of grade one, like wasn't doing anything at the middle of grade one, I would be nervous and I would be looking, are there other signs? Um, usually it, it's not just the child's doing everything brilliantly. And there's some, the, the, there are flags that one can look for. But because we know early intervention keeps the doors open, we want to intervene as early as we can. Having said that, um, you know, some children go to junior kindergarten reading fluently, um, really fluently. And, and other children are reading fluently and progress nicely. Things are going well by the end of grade one. So there isn't, I, I'm reluctant to say there's an average, but you want to make sure by grade one Christmas time, uh, December recess time, sorry, you, we want to make sure that your child's getting their feet on that reading road. And if they're not on that December uh, report card, I would be nervous myself personally. If, if the child at that point still didn't know that B made B or could not blend F and L or B and L or, um, you know, I would be a bit nervous about that and would want to start thinking about what else is going on, especially if rule out, if they, it's not ears, it's not speech, it's, then I would want to, I would want to investigate. I have a, another question here. Um, there are three languages spoken in my house, but my child will only be going to an English school. Will this confuse them if they hear all of the languages in the house? Okay, I'm glad you asked this. <laughs> I'm really glad, so thank you very much. Um, children who are coming from uh, multilingual homes, um, the research is really rich and really clear. Um, those children, because language, <clears throat> language carries culture, language carries knowledge, language is not, um, is not uh, something that are simply a word, um, but it, it carries cultural knowledge. It's a train of cultural knowledge. It's a train of, of um, how you understand the world. And children who come out of multilingual homes, they tend to be more compassionate, more empathetic, um, uh, better able to understand their classmates and peers. And sometimes, not all of them, sometimes, uh, they take up reading a tiny bit slower, but they get it, barring there's no other intervening factors. Um, I would say if, if two or three languages are being spoken to a child, it's a blessing for the child um, because we know it's a, it's a carrier of, of knowledge, how the child understands him or her or they self in the world and the culture upon which that language comes from. I think it's super important and I really would encourage you to continue doing that. Um, and if it, French is not one of them, think about putting your child in French immersion to get one more. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking them. Um, another question here. Uh, because of the pandemic, my son has been in online junior kindergarten. I don't really think he's learning much and I'm scared he will be behind next year. Is there anything I can do to catch him up? Yeah, that's a really good question too. All the things that we've been talking about now um, are things that you can do. I don't think that the youngsters are gonna be behind. We are gonna, there's gonna have to be a big assessment of every youngster who comes into the building post COVID. And we're gonna have to start where the children are, not just their 
academic learning needs, but their social and emotional learning needs are also going to have to be assessed. But all the things that we talked about tonight, uh, those are all things that we can we can be doing with children, reading to them, uh, taking them out into the you know the playground or wherever you have access to. If you have a backyard, uh, out for a walk and talking to them, little science science experiments that can be done at home, and really trying to create those vocabulary rich experiences. Baking is so good. I watch my daughter do. My grandson's two and change and he's up on the counter and she's talking him through all this baking stuff, which, you know, I don't know how much of it he gets, but that's the thing. We don't know when that penny's going to drop for a particular concept. So we just keep bathing the little darlings in it. And it's a loving thing. Baking with mommy is a loving thing. So it's, it's doubly good. Um, I'm not sure whether you can answer this, but we'll put it out there. Uh, any recommendations for a phonologically based program in early elementary? I'm not sure what a phonologically based program is. Um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the question. So the example they, they gave was lively letters. So I'm, I'm assuming any programs that you would, would recommend yeah. that are out there. Um, I'm an Orton Gillingham trained tutor, so I, that's always my go-to. Um, uh, um, structured literacy, if you look at the in, um, IDA, International Dyslexia Association, it's got a great 10-page PDF on structured literacy. Um, that benefits all kids, um, and they give some really good examples in there, and that's free and available on the web from the from International Dyslexia Association, structured literacy. Um, so, um, yeah. That, that I would have a look there. That would be my recommendation. And there's one there's one recommendation that came up here, and, and it's one that we um, often talk about uh, is Jolly Phonics is ones that that parents might have seen. Um, yeah, I'm not a. I uh, what's good about Jolly Phonics is it thinks about the learning triangle, so the visual, auditory. So kids who who youngsters they're always doing all three things they see things they hear things and they touch things jolly phonics is good because it attaches an action to a sound because really what is what is a what is a letter b uh, but when the kid starts swinging his or her they hands like a bat um, usually that's a good link and helps the kid make that scaffolding jolly phonics is providing scaffolding to help the kid across the bridge to understand uh, that the letter B um, is a picture of uh, the sound B. So yeah, it's a good place to start. Uh, I don't like the short vowels. That's my only problem with it. Um, I have another question here. I have dyslexia myself and struggle to read and am scared to read to my child and have them pick up bad habits. Will this hurt them if I read to them? I don't think so. I think that it, I remember myself reading to my children and I see now my daughter and son-in-law reading to their crew and it's a very loving thing. Um, and when they're this young, they don't know what's really on the page. Um, and all that beautiful questioning that I hear my daughter and son-in-law, what comes next? How do you think he's feeling? What would you do if you're in that situation? That's all just really rich um, support for children and story. Um, the other thing too is the libraries, and if you're in Ontario, it's the most, the one that I'm dying to get my hands on is um, Overdrive, um, and they have, um, it's free, you go to the library and they give you a little code and you, you can put it on your phone, and then you can download audiobooks, and a child could um, hear those audiobooks, but it's not the same thing as uh, cuddling up in, in a parent or guardian's lap, and that's a love fest and that's teaching children that this is something that we love to do and we love to do it together. I've even seen my daughter and son-in-law, two of them in there together with the child reading. Um, so that's, you know, I read away and do your best and, um, you know, go for it. Thank you for asking that. Good. Um, another question here is my, son does not speak English well, but he is very good in um, his mother tongue. Since he's going to start preschool soon, should I start to talk to him in English more? 
Um, my answer is unequivocally, no. Um, we live, I don't know where you live, but um, most of Canada, albeit Quebec and some of the communities, specific communities, the children are bathed in English. Everywhere they go, they're bathed in English, but whatever your mother tongue is, your L1, I, I don't know where you live, but, and I don't know what your L1 is, but, but no, um, the youngsters, um, when they come to uh, kindergarten, you'll be, your head's going to spin how quickly your child will pick it up. Um, and so that thing that he does or she does at home, or they do at home with you uh, in, your, in your mother language. Um, and because remember you're, you're transmitting culture you're also giving your child a scaffold to other family members who might not speak English. That's too valuable to let go of. Your child is gonna learn English of that, I'm sure. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of, of, of keeping going with your first language. It's a great I, question. Thank you for asking it. And I have time for one last question here. Um, with the pandemic being really hard, to read every night. I am very tired, but I've been yeah. told that my daughter will be behind if I don't read every night. Is that true? Do you know what? That just sounds like guilt parenting to me. <laughs> sounds like someone trying to make you feel that that's uh, no, um, no, no, because you're still talking to your child. You're still having other experiences with your child. Some nights you just need a break. Um, that's, that's a really good time for your child to have a, a little device there, but the only thing they can do is listen to a book on tape. Mommy's really tired tonight. Um, you're going to listen to the book on tape. That just sounds like, you know, I, some nights you just can't do it. You just can't do it and you need to take a break and COVID is gnarly and I think children can understand and I think that overdrive um, or those old fashioned old Fisher Price tapes, you know, just push play. And then the child normally just falls asleep to it anyways. So they're not going to be behind. Keep talking to them. Uh, it's going to be okay. It's really going to be okay. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. We actually did have a couple more questions. And so for those who I didn't get to the questions, I will send them along to, to Sandra um, and provide you those answers. But I do want to thank everyone for sending along those questions. It always makes for a much more engaging and informative session when we can actually get to you and your concerns and, and really tackle the things that you're interested in. So once again, thank you so much, Sandra, for such a My great pleasure. presentation. It was um, lovely to have you here. I always love working with you and this was no exception. And for everyone who is on the line, Please feel free to reach out to us at Dyslexia Canada. If you have any questions or concerns, check out our website, dyslexiacanada.org. Also, I again, I'm going to pitch our upcoming webinar and our cartooning event. So any kids out there that love to draw and cartoon, feel free to sign them up and come join us in June for that event. And I just wanted to say too, thank you, Christine. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is. Um, I study dyslexia, that's my research uh, agenda. And if anybody has, um, and I, I'm really, uh, early elementary is, is up to grade three is what I'm interested in. Um, if anybody has any recommendations for other webinars that they would like Dyslexia Canada do, to do, just um, you can reach out to Christine. Um, and and if, if we can't do it, then I can usually track down a colleague or, or friend or someone uh, who can do it. But we wanna try to get information out there. Um, so. Um, uh, feel free to give suggestions. And thank you very much for giving up your time and stay safe. My goodness, please be safe. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you everyone on the line. Have a great evening.